A hearty Pittsburgh welcome to you, Monsignor John Rodano. It is a great pleasure and an honor to introduce you at the 13th annual St. Cyril and Methodius Lecture sponsored by the Byzantine Catholic Seminary in Pittsburgh. Some 2,000 years ago, our Master Jesus Christ taught us how to live. Among other words that were recorded, he said, I am the vine and you are the branches. If a man does not abide in me, he is cast forth as a branch and withers. He also said, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. In another place he prayed, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you. It seems that we Christians have always made it our practice to pick and choose among the teachings of Christ, and his teachings on unity and charity are among the ones we often ignore. Nowadays, it seems any time is a good time to split a church, and any reason is a good reason to disregard charity. Monsignor Rodano has dedicated his priestly life to the quest for church unity. He has diligently studied the causes of division and has studied how we can, as far as humanly possible, contribute to the healing of the body of Christ, to binding up the wounds, pouring wine and oil on them. Monsignor Rodano is recognized internationally as a scholar in ecumenism. He is a priest of the Diocese of Newark and is now an adjunct professor of systematic theology at Seton Hall University. He has published in many journals, both Catholic and non-Catholic, and has taught at University of St. Thomas in St. Paul, Minnesota, St. Joseph Seminary in Dunwoody, New York, Notre Dame University, and at the Pontifical University of St. Thomas Aquinas in Rome. He has received three papal honors culminating in 2008 with appointment as proto-notary apostolic supernumerary by Pope Benedict. Monsignor, we have all suffered injury because of the divisions in the body of Christ, and we eagerly await your words of wisdom on the subject of ecumenism. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be invited here this evening to give this lecture. As I mentioned um, to some of you, when I arrived at St. Cyril and Methodius Seminary this morning, this uh, is the second time that I came to St. Cyril and Methodius Seminary. The first time was in 1960. In 1960, I was a seminarian uh, Immaculate Conception Seminary of the Archdiocese of Newark, first year seminarian. And in 1960, the National Liturgical Conference was held here in Pittsburgh. And so some of us seminarians decided to take a little trip out and uh, attend the liturgical conference. And uh, somehow, we got an invitation to St. Cyril and Methodius Seminary. And so we spent uh, an afternoon at the seminary. And um, I don't remember very much of what happened in the liturgical conference, except the Bishop of Pittsburgh had a very bad cold when he, when he spoke, and you could hear the cold, his cold. But I do remember very much what happened at the seminary. We were sat down, and somebody began to tell us about the way they perceived Latin Catholics' attitudes toward Byzantine Catholics. They told us that um, um, in very, in some ways, they Latin Catholics don't understand Byzantine Catholics. Sometimes they insult them. Whether they're aware of it or not, they insult them because they simply don't know the tradition. And um, we sat there listening to this, and I would say this made a very big impression on me. And I have told others about this over the years. And in fact, 30 years later, 
I was at a meeting of the World Council of Churches Central Committee in 1990. And this, of course, was just after the fall of communism. And Eastern Catholic churches, which had been buried in uh, communist countries, began to, to come alive and, and to surface, and they began to ask for their churches back, churches that had been taken away from them decades before. And they began to ask for the churches ba- uh, to, to, uh, to come back to them. And the Orthodox members of the Central Committee uh, perhaps didn't know how to deal with that. And they interpreted the, uh, what the Eastern Catholics were doing as aggression, very much aggression against them. And they were asking for the help of the World Council of Churches against the Eastern Catholics. And this went on for about a week. And there were no Eastern Catholics there to respond to any of the, because this is all very sensitive for everybody. So towards the end of the week, I decided that I had to say something about this. So I asked for the floor close to the end of the meeting. I was trying to time it in the way that I could have the last word. (laughs) In any case, uh, what I said was basically what I learned here at St. Cyril, at St. Cyril, that the Eastern Catholics, um, they had suffered greatly under communism. They wanted to be respected. They wanted to have their own historic practices respected and the freedom to practice their faith uh, in their way, of which they had been deprived for decades. It was a very brief speech that I made But apparently, uh, some people told me the next day that it made some impact. But it was basically, I remember at that time, thinking when I I had to do that, thinking of what I experienced at St. Cyril and Methodius in in 1960. So it made uh, some impact on me. And um, it continues to to be on my mind. So thank you, thank you, St. Cyril and Methodius for giving me those, those insights. My uh, topic today is the continuing reconciliation between Orthodox and Catholics, a key to ecumenical progress in the 21st century, a key. There are various keys, I think. For example, I would say, first of all, here in the 21st century, uh, this is a time of um, taking stock of what a century of ecumenism since Edinburgh World Mission Conference in 1910 has taught us. It's a time to um, take what we've achieved and put it into a new level. And what are the keys to doing it? I believe the continuing rec- reconciliation between Orthodox and Catholics is one of those keys because if we can go to the point of really putting behind us nine centuries of hostility, that would be a marvelous thing, not only for Orthodox and Catholics, but for all of us, all Christians. I think there are other keys. For example, one is coming up very quickly in 2017, which is known as the the 500th anniversary of the Reformation when Martin Luther attacked his 95 theses on in Wittenberg in the church door as it's thought. And uh, how do we deal with that anniversary after we've had, we've made marvelous um, steps forward in Lutheran Catholic relations, signing in 1999 the Joint Declaration on the Doctrine of Justification, which solves the theological problem of Martin Luther, how we are justified, how we are saved by God and by faith and by God's intervention in our lives, it solves his problem, which in the 16th century was a major uh, cause of the, the differences on that, a major cause of the, the division that took place. It's a key. How we deal with 2017? Can we make it a step forward now that we've gone so far in that dialogue? Or will, will we not be able to do that? Another key is how we deal with the, how all Christians deal with the growing Pentecostal movement. 
650 million Pentecostals. It's one of the uh, fastest growing Christian movements in the world. And um, uh, we have a good Catholic Pentecostal dialogue to solve some of the issues there. But how we deal with that, that's another key in the 20th century. But um, let's return to this key. I thought in this setting, I spoke about that Lutheran question a year ago in another setting. So I thought in this setting, this might be a good time to speak about Orthodox Catholic relations. Section one, Vatican II, and the renewal of Orthodox Catholic relations. In the century since the 1910 World Missionary Conference in Edinburgh, Scotland, the starting point of the modern ecumenical movement, much has been accomplished in moving divided Christians toward unity. Since the Second Vatican Council, 1962 to 65, I'm told that many young people don't know what the Second Vatican, when the Second Vatican Council was, was held, so just in case, 1962 to 65. The Catholic Church since then has participated deeply in the modern ecumenical movement. Ecumenical dialogue among Christian churches has produced many fine reports. The 15 international dialogues in which the Catholic Church has been involved since Vatican II have shown remarkable convergences and even agreements on many theological issues, once considered areas of disagreement. The story of each of these dialogues should be told. But one can argue that the relationships, including dialogue, between the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church over the last 50 years has achieved a very great ecumenical scope and profundity. It's been, I think, one of the, one of the best dialogues. Point one, the decree on ecumenism and the Eastern churches. What did Vatican II say about the Orthodox? In the Decree on Ecumenism, Numbers 14 to 18, it speaks of the special position of Eastern churches. Of these, many glory in taking their origins from the apostles themselves. From their very origins, the churches of the East have had a treasury from which the Church of the West has amply drawn for its liturgy, spiritual tradition, and jurisprudence. Basic dogmas of the Christian faith Trinity, God's word made flesh of the Virgin Mary, were defined in ecumenical councils held in the East. The first seven ecumenical councils from Nicaea 3, 1, 325 to Nicaea 2, 787, were held in or not far from Constantinople. From the earliest times, the Eastern churches followed their own disciplines, sanctioned by the Holy Fathers, by synods, even ecumenical councils. The decree on ecumenism goes on, praising the liturgy of the East. Through the celebration of the Eucharist, it says, in each of these churches, the Church of God is built up and grows in stature. They pay high tribute to Mary of a Virgin. They give homage to the saints, including fathers of the universal church. Though separated from us, they possess true sacraments. Above all, by apostolic succession, the priesthood and the Eucharist, whereby they are still joined to us in a very close relationship, and therefore some worship in common is not merely possible, but is recommended. We have to respect the discipline of the other church as well. Monastic traditions flourished in the East and provided a source from which Latin monastic life took its rise. The decree on ecumenism draws certain conclusions from this. The importance of seeking unity, which is unity in diversity. To seek full communion with these churches, it is necessary, quote, to give due, due consideration to these aspects of the origin and growth of the churches of the East and to the character of the relations which are obtained between them and the Roman See before separation. All should realize that it's supremely important to understand, venerate, preserve and foster the exceedingly rich liturgical tradition and spiritual heritage of the Eastern churches in order faithfully to preserve the fullness of Christian tradition and to bring about reconciliation between Eastern and Western Christians. Point two, looking back over 50 years, a survey of renewed 
Orthodox Catholic relations. Here, in dealing with this, I'm going to emphasize primarily relations between the Holy See and the Patriarchate of Constantinople. Uh, we have, there are many good relations between, uh, between the Holy See and the Church of Moscow, for example, over decades, good relations with the Romanian Orthodox Church and, and many others, more recently good relations with, with the Greek Orthodox Church. But I, I want to just limit this because I think there's a lot to see in just this relationship as we go forward. Ecumenical contacts um, were, were already beginning during the years of the Second Vatican Council when it was in session. It could be said that the Catholic Church's first ecumenical partner, when it opened itself to the modern ecumenical movement at the time of Vatican II, was the World Council of Churches. A number of significant events already took place between the WCC and the Catholic Church between 1960 and 1965, when the Council was in session. In 1961, for example, for the first time, the Holy See sent observers to the, 19, uh, to the World Council's General Assembly in New Delhi in 1961. At almost the same time, new relations developed uh, among Orthodox and Catholics, especially between the seas of Rome and Constantinople. These relations began to develop quickly. Consider these points in three time periods according uh, to who was Pope and ecumenical patriarch of each period. I'm going to give a kind of chronology of, of, of this, these relationships. The first period, 1962 to 1972, the time of Patriarch Athenagoras I and Pope Paul VI. After long centuries of silence, new contacts began with correspondence between Constantinople and Rome starting in 1958. Since 1962, the leaders of the Church of Rome and of Constantinople uh, and later other Orthodox churches began to speak of one another as sister churches. This, it seems this expression was first used by Patriarch Athenagoras in 1962, then several more times before 1965 in correspondence mostly with Pope Paul Pope Paul VI. In January of 1964, Pope Paul VI and ecumenical patriarch Athenagoras met in Jerusalem, the first personal meeting between a pope and patriarch for centuries. Warm relations began. And uh, at this time, the Orthodox were gradually becoming observer delegates at Vatican II, especially in the third and fourth sessions. In 1965, in their historic common declaration, Paul VI and Athenagoras I expressed regret and removed both from the memory and from the midst of the church the sentences of excommunication of 1054 and committed these excommunications to oblivion and called for dialogue between their peoples aim, aiming at full communion. The de their declaration states that these actions went much further than intended. They directed these censures against persons and not the churches. The censures were not intended to break ecclesial communion between the seas of Rome and Constantinople. And so they make this agreement with the sense that they express the, the sentiments of the faithful, not just their own ideas, but the faithful. They acknowledge that this is only a start and must, much more has to be done under the Holy Spirit to bring a real healing to these divisions. And this common declaration was read just before the end of the Vatican Council on December 7th, 1965, simultaneously in the Vatican Council itself and in Istanbul, Constantinople, at the Fanar, the headquarters of the Patriarchate. John Paul II, 30 years later, in his 1995 encyclical Urunum Sint, described this as, quote, an ecclesial act, an 
ecclesial event, a solemn act. The council ended, John Paul said, with a solemn act which was at once a healing of historical memories, a, a mutual forgiveness, and a firm commitment to strive for communion. It is remarkable to me that this great act was done at the, just about at the beginning of their relationship, before there was even dialogue. And yet they had the sense that enough is enough. Nine centuries is enough. Let's do it. Let's do it now. In 1967, Pope Paul VI offered a theological explanation of the term sister churches. In that year, the Pope and the Patriarch exchanged visits. When Pope Paul VI visited Constantinople in July 67, in his letter to Athenagoras, Anno Ineunte, he expressed his understanding of the theological meaning of the term sister churches in this way, quote, God has granted us to receive in faith what the apostles saw, understood, and proclaimed to us. By baptism, we are one in Christ Jesus. In virtue of the apostolic succession, we are united more closely by the priesthood and the Eucharist. For centuries, we lived this life of sister churches and together held ecumenical councils which guarded the deposit of faith against all corruption. And now, after a long period of division, the Lord is enabling us to discover ourselves as sister churches once more, in spite of the obstacles once raised between us. In the light of Christ, we see how urgent is the need of surmounting these obstacles to bring to its fullness and perfection the already very rich communion that exists between us. On both sides, we profess the fundamental dogmas of the Christian faith on the Trinity, on the word of God who took flesh of the Virgin Mary, as these were defined in the ecumenical councils held in the East. And we have true sacraments and a hierarchical priesthood in common. Of course, the, um, the designation sister churches also continue to be used afterwards up to this day by, by popes and, and patriarchs. It's also found in uh, some of the dialogues of the Orthodox, Orthodox Catholic, some of the reports of the Orthodox Catholic dialogue. It's found in papal encyclicals, Slavorum Apostoli and Udunum Sint. And so the term is, uh, the use of the term in those circumstances is growing. Patriarch Athenagoras visited Rome in 1967. And I think another factor resulting from these exchange, this exchange of visits, uh, this inspired mutual reciprocal visits which began later in the 1970s between delegates um, of, each of, the, of each to the other, sometimes led by a pope or, or patriarch on the occasion of the other's patronal feasts. And these are genuine and reciprocal acts of the dialogue of love, the necessary ingredient of the healing of long and bitter memories and the building of mutual trust. And this has continued until now. In 1971, Paul VI described the deep level of communion already shared by Orthodox and Catholics in a letter to Patriarch Athenagoras, February 1971, concerning relations between the two churches, Paul said that, quote, during the week of unity, we kept on reminding the faithful assembled in the Basilica of St. Peter that between our church and the venerable Orthodox churches, there already exists a communion which is almost complete, though still short of perfection, deriving from our common participation in the mystery of Christ and his church. And this new relationship uh, began, came to be documented in two ways, at, even at this early time. In paper, in the, uh, putting, when they put together the, the Tomos Agapis, 1958 to 1970, and published all the letters and communications in that period, at the, uh, at the request of both Pope Paul VI and, and Patriarch Athenagoras. An expanded version of this 
was published in 1987, uh, from 19, covering 1958 to 1984. And that volume was given to Patriarch Demetrios in 1987 when he visited Rome. He was given that volume of the expanded uh, Tomos Agapis. But even more, in a certain way, these meetings of Pope and Patriarch in 1967 were inscribed in stone at um, St. Peter's Basilica. As you went to the atrium of St. Peter's Basilica and look up on the right, high on the right, you see in stone there carved an inscription in Latin and Greek which refers to the visit of Patri Patriarch Athenagoras in 1967. It says, here in 1967, Pope Paul VI and Patriarch, Ecumenical Patriarch Athenagoras met to promote the full communion of their churches. Twenty years later, when Patriarch Demetrios, successor of Athenagoras, visited Rome in 1987, another inscription was carved into the wall just below the first. And uh, also in Latin and Greek, it said, here in 1987, Pope John Paul II and Ecumenical Patriarch Demetrios I met to promote the full communion of their churches. This last inscription was already completed even before Patriarch Demetrios completed his visit as his motorcade left Vatican City on the way to the, air to the airport with his delegation. It made a final stop in front of St. Peter's Basilica and the patriarch and the delegation were escorted into the atrium of the basilica and shown the inscription that would memorialize his visit. So put in stone, it's a very, it's a very interesting that, you know, we mean this, we have to go forward the way, the way it's, it's described in this way. This brings us to the second period in this chronology, 1978 to 1991, the time of patriarch Demetrios I, and John Paul II. During John Paul II's visit to the Fanar in 1979, on the occasion of the celebration of the Feast of St. Andrew, he and Patriarch Demetrios called for the theological dialogue between Orthodox and Catholics, which then began in 1980. It has been a very effective theological dialogue. There's also been a very significant national Orthodox Catholic dialogue here that began um, in 1965 with the blessing of Patriarch Athenagoras and with the assistance of staff members of the Vatican Secretariat for Promoting Christian Unity. This national dialogue has produced important results. The international dialogue has, has uh, produced uh, important results which we will return to in a moment. But also, the visit of Demetrios to Rome in 1987, he, uh, he and John Paul II made a common confession of the faith using the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed in the original Greek. They did this during a Eucharistic liturgy in St. Peter's Basilica when, um, at, this, at this time. This has been done also later by John Paul II and Bartholomew in 1995 and in 2004 when, when uh, Bartholomew I visited Rome, then by Bartholomew and Benedict XVI in 2008 in Rome. Thirdly, Demetrios and John Paul on, that, on Demetrios' visit in 1987 honored Mary in a very special way. That was the Marian year that John Paul II had called for. And one of the great events in that visit was a Vesper service at the Basilica of St. Mary Major. Both John Paul II and Demetrios preached on Mary two wonderful homilies. The Patriarch's homily, I think, was especially extraordinary, but they were honoring Mary together in a very uh, beautiful way. Returning to the international dialogue, it produced several significant reports during the 1980s. It was preparing to deal with more difficult issues leading up to the question of the primacy when the fall of communism in Eastern and Central Europe created conditions 
that made it impossible to continue the dialogue uh, after 1990. And the new emergence of, of Eastern Catholic uh, churches who were once uh, buried under communism and, and how the, the Orthodox uh, reacted to that uh, made, it, made it important to turn the dialogue to the question of relations with Eastern, with the Eastern uh, Catholics. And so in Balaam and Lebanon, 1993, they published, the dialogue published the text, Uniatism, Method of Union of the Past and the Present Search for Full Communion. It includes two central affirmations. First, that the method, which has been called uniatism, is rejected because it is opposed to the common tradition of both churches. Second, it unequivocally affirms that the Eastern Catholic churches both say, Orthodox and Catholics, that the Eastern Catholic churches have the right to exist and to act in response to the spiritual needs of their faithful. And it called upon Eastern Catholics to participate in the dialogue at all levels. The document rules out all forms of proselytism between Catholics and Orthodox, affirming that salvation is available in either church. When the dialogue finally got back to the original agenda 12 years later, it published in 2007 after its meeting in Ravenna, Italy, the document called Ecclesiological and Canonical Consequences of the Sacramental Nature of the Church, Ecclesial Communion, Conciliarity, and Authority, exploring the way the institutional aspects of the Church visibly express and serve the mystery of koinonia, and starting with the relationship between the one father and the two other hypostases within the Holy Trinity, it looks at the relationship of the one and the many on all levels of the church, local, regional, and universal. In each case, it is a matter of the one primate and the authority he must have in order to ensure unity among the many. This was a challenge both to Catholics who have tended to downplay the importance of the regional level and to the Orthodox who have downplayed the universal level. The document's treatment of the relationship between the one and the many at the universal level is very significant. Its conclusions regarding the primacy of the Bishop of Rome are found in paragraphs 43 and 44. You probably have heard them, but I think it's good to hear them again. 43. Primacy and conciliarity are mutually interdependent. That is why primacy at the different levels in the life of the church, local, regional, and universal, must always be considered in the context of conciliarity. And conciliarity, likewise, in the context of primacy. Concerning primacy at the different levels, we wish to affirm the following points. One, primacy at all levels is a practice firmly grounded in the canonical tradition of the church. Two, while the fact of primacy at the universal level is accepted by both East and West, there are differences of understanding with regard to the manner in which it is to be exercised, and also with regard to scriptural and theological foundations. 44, in the history of the East and of the West, at least until the ninth century, a series of prerogatives were recognized always in the context of conciliarity, according to the conditions of the times, for the protos or kephale at each of the established ecclesiastical levels, locally for the bishop as protos of his diocese with regard to, for his presbyters and people, regionally for the protos at each metropolis with regard to the bishops of his province, and for the protos of each of the five patriarchates with regard to the metropolitans of each circumscription, and universally for the Bishop of Rome as protos among the patriarchs. This distinction of levels does not diminish the sacramental equality of every bishop or the Catholicity of each local church. The dialogue then decided that its next topic would be the role of the Bishop of Rome in the Koinonia Communion of the Church of the First Millennium, a draft text was developed and discussed, but it was found to need further revision. 
It appears that the Joint Commission decided that the analysis of the historical development of the papacy might not be as fruitful as originally thought, and that the way forward was to look at the question from a more theological perspective. Thus, the plenary decided to form a subcommission to begin consideration of the theological and ecclesiological aspects of primacy in relation to synodality. According to Bishop Brian Farrell, who is the secretary of the Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity, I called him and asked him, what is the current situation of the dialogue? And he said that um, the dialogue's coordinating committee at its meeting in Paris in November 2012 agreed to a draft document on the relationship between primacy and synodality in the life of the church at the local, regional, universal levels, which could present it, be presented to the next plenary meeting uh, of the Joint uh, Commission, probably at the beginning of 2014. According to Bishop Farrell, it undoubtedly represents a positive outcome, <clears throat> which he hopes <clears throat> will offer a theological and ecclesiological framework within which to confront the question of the ways in which the primacy of the Bishop of Rome at the universal level might be exercised once full communion between the churches of the East and West has been reestablished. He said the methodological approach is very positive as, the as it has been in the dialogue from the beginning, not simply comparative analysis of differences, but rather a theologically creative outlook seeking new ways to present together the traditional patrimony of the Catholic and Orthodox churches, seeking to overcome polemical and apologetical oppositions that developed over the centuries. So the Joint Commission in 2014 will have to deal with that. Farrell observed that there is no shortage of objective difficulties in this regard, not only because there remains a certain diversity on the part of Catholics and Orthodox in their approach to the theme, but also due to different approaches within the delegations themselves. Nonetheless, he judged in a positive sense that the efforts undertaken over the year to continue this important work could be considered to be a small step along the journey toward unity. The third period of this chronology, 1992 to 2013, increasing contacts of popes and patriarchs at this time and more cooperation on mission. Of course, in this period, there is one ecumenical patriarch, Bartholomew, and three popes, John Paul II, <clears throat> Benedict XVI, and Pope Francis. Increasing, increasing contacts and uh, increasing ways of common mission in this period. In 1994, for example, John Paul II invited Bartholomew to write the meditations for the Way of the Cross, which the Pope leads on Good Friday at the Colosseum in Rome. It's the first time that someone not a Roman Catholic has been invited to write them. So in this process, they witness together to the cross of Christ. In the year 2000, John Paul II invites the ecumenical patriarch Kate and the Archbishop of Canterbury to join him in the Catholic tradition for a holy year of opening the door of the Basilica of St. Paul outside the wall, to push it open together, symbolizing we're going towards Christ together. And then representatives of many other churches followed them as they, as they, did, as they uh, did that. In that same jubilee year, John Paul included in Rome's calendar for the holy year a suggestion of Bartholomew, that a request of Bartholomew that special events regarding the holy year take place on the Feast of the Transfiguration. So that came into the Roman calendar also. In 2002, um, the Pope invited religious leaders to Assisi, religious leaders of all Christian groups and 
world religions, he invited them to Assisi for a day of prayer for peace. Bartholomew joined in that, and although um, it was, of course, um, John Paul II who led it, Bartholomew had a very prominent role in the service. Again in 2002, this time Bartholomew invited the Pope to, uh, to take part in an initiative on the environment. Uh, Bartholomew, in one of his uh, trips, this time on the Adriatic, his boat trips, in order to explore the failings of ecology, uh, in, in Venice, um, he and the Pope, the Pope in Rome, they made use of technology so they could be together through technology, and they both signed uh, they both signed a, um, a common declaration on the environmental ethics for the safeguard of creation, June 10th, 2002. In 2004, there, again, there were again two contacts. <coughs> Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew came to Rome for, uh, with, the, with the delegation on June 29th, the Feast of Peter and Paul, but also to celebrate the 40th anniversary of the meeting of Athenagoras and Paul VI in Jerusalem in 1964. And um, so that they, they came together to remember that. And they also, in the liturgy, the Eucharistic liturgy on June 29th, both gave homilies. They recited together the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed in Greek and they blessed the people at the end of the liturgy with their respective liturgical formulas. Also in, um, in 2004, at the request of Bartholomew, Pope John Paul II gave some relics of St. John Chrysostom and St. Gregory Nazianzen to the Ecumenical Patriarchate. The Patriarch came to Rome to receive these gifts and there was a beautiful, prayerful ceremony at St. Peter's Basilica. Of course, relics had been returned much er earlier in other settings, but this was a very beautiful service. And again, recognizing the fact that these were great fathers of the church for both of us, and so we share their relics. 2005, Bartholomew came for the funeral of John Paul II. In 2006, on the occasion of the, um, the patronal feast of Constantinople, Pope Benedict led the de Catholic delegation participating in that feast. In 2008, again, there were two events where they came together. First, the Pauline year. Uh, both Pope Benedict and Patriarch Bartholomew had independently called for a Pauline year celebrating the 2000th anniversary of the birth of St. Paul, and each organized specific events for that occasion. In Rome, the Pauline, Pauline year opened on June 29th, the feasts of Peter and Paul, and Benedict invited Bartholomew to come with the delegation to share in the solemn festivities. And he was present at the Vesper service celebrated by Benedict on Saturday, June 28th at the Basilica of St. Paul outside the wall. Present too were representatives of other Orthodox churches associated with St. Paul, and representatives of other Christian world communions. And the next day, the Patriarch was present at the celebration of the liturgy on the Feast of Saints Peter and Paul in St. Peter's Basilica. And again, together they blessed those present they recited the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed in Greek, and they both preached. Again in 2008, in, 2000, uh, in 2008, Bartholomew came to Rome for a second time at the invitation of Pope Benedict to participate in the 12th ordinarily, Ordinary Assembly of the Synod of Bishops on the theme, The Word of God in the Life and Mission of the Church. October 2008. On Saturday, October 18th at 5 p.m. <clears throat> in the Sistine Chapel, Pope, ben Pope Benedict presided over the celebration of the first Vespers of the 24th Sunday of Ordinary Time. Bartholomew 
participated along with members of the Synod, and he gave a lengthy address on the Synod's theme, the Word of God. And um, he noted that it's the first time in history that an ecumenical patriarch is offered the opportunity to address a synod of the bishops of the Roman Catholic Church and thus be part of the life of this sister church at such a high level. And uh, so he saw the importance of all of this. And in his address, which was a beautiful address, he commented also on the notion of the synodical system and its ecumenical potential. In 2012, opening the year of faith declared by Pope Benedict XVI on the occasion of the celebration of the, also of the 50th anniversary of the opening of the Second Vatican Council. And again, Bartholomew was invited. Uh, on Thursday, October 11th, at a 10, 10 o'clock mass, the Pope presided at the Eucharistic celebration at St. Peter's Basilica, outside of the Basilica. And concelebrating with him were those participating in the, minute, in the meeting of the Synod of Bishops for the new evangelization. The Ecumenical Patriarch and the Archbishop of Canterbury were there as well. And Bartholomew was invited to give an address toward the end of the liturgy after the prayer after communion. And in his address, he mentioned the ecumenical achievement of Vatican II for the Catholic Church, and also its importance because it led to the mutual rescinding of the excommunications of the year 1054, and it led to the exchange of greetings that now takes place, returning of relics, entering into dialogues, visiting each other, our respective sees, even though our journey has not always been easy or without uh, pain and challenge. But he said, our presence here signifies and seals our commitment to witness together to the gospel message of salvation and, and healing. <clears throat> Bartholomew, as you know, was also present at the installation of Pope Francis, first time that an ecumenical patriarch has been present at this event. And I believe he uh, asked the Pope to join him in Jerusalem next January to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the meeting of Athenagoras and Paul, Pope Paul VI. After this brief chronology, we need to speak briefly, at least, of difficulties in Orthodox Catholic relations. Many important things have developed, many good things, but there are also many difficulties. Reactions to the Ballaman document in 1993 illustrate the intense emotions, deep animosity still hovering in some places over this Orthodox Catholic relationship. In a recent article, Father Ron Robertson, <coughs> in a new book that's coming out these days on Bartholomew, published by Erdman's Press, uh, he has an article, Ron has an article, and uh, he uh, described the reactions to Balamond. Pope John Paul II and Patriarch Bartholomew basically assessed it very positively. But on the local level, reactions were decidedly mixed. In Greece, the Holy Synod of the Orthodox Church condemned the Balamond document in the strongest terms, calling it utterly foreign to the centuries-long Orthodox tradition and as antithetical to all the decisions on the dialogue with the Roman Catholic Church taken by pan-Orthodox conferences. In December 1993, the influential monastic community on Mount Athos sent a letter to Patriarch Bartholomew denouncing Balamond. They objected especially to the document statement that the Catholic and Orthodox churches both possess the means of salvation. We are obliged never to accept union, the monks wrote, or the description of the Roman Catholic Church or the Pope as, canonical, as the canonical Bishop of Rome or the Church of Rome as having canonical apostolic succession, priesthood, and mysteries without their expressly, expressly stated renunciation of the filioque, the infallibility and primacy of the Pope, created grace, and the rest of their 
Kardos Doxies. In Romania, the document was approved by the Holy Synod of the Orthodox Church, but condemned by the country's Catholic bishops. It was only in the Ukraine that Balaman gained support from both Eastern Catholics and Orthodox. So he shows the mixed reactions and we, we cannot be blind to the obstacles that, that are still there. Section two, a unique ecumenical relationship. These are smaller sections. <clears throat> one can argue, I think, when you look at everything that's happened, one can argue that among um, the various international relationships with other Christian churches and communions long divided by the Catholic Church and with which since Vatican II it has now developed new and positive relationships. The relationships between Orthodox and Catholics I think, I think are, are particularly deep in what we've seen so far. We've heard what Vatican II said about the special position of the Eastern churches. The Common Declaration of 1965 puts aside a great icon of division. The continuing close relationships maintained by the Seas of Rome and Constantinople as high-level delegations have met twice a year since the 70s on the patronal feasts of each, each. This is the most consistent in any relationship that I know of. I've dealt mostly with relationships with the Western churches, and they have nothing as consistent, there's not, nothing as consistent as this. With the Lutherans, we have, since 1988, the annual joint staff meetings, once in Rome, once in Geneva. These are very good, but they don't have a liturgical content that the uh, exchanges of visits on the patronal feasts have. Uh, and also with the Anglicans, there have been what we call the informal talks. They're always held in Rome. They're good, they're high-level meetings. A lot is, a lot is uh, done, but uh, it's once a year. Uh, and um, again, it doesn't have the liturgical concept, content. And the personal contacts between popes and patriarchs, as you can see, have been consistent and more recently have been frequent, more frequent. And um, also in these, since these contacts began, the mutual evaluation of the degree of shared communion has been characteristic in the sense of the, the mutual use of the term sister churches, despite the objections of some, maybe in both churches, but it, it's continually used without any hesitation. And the, the expression of Paul VI, that an almost perfect communion exists. And the returning of relics and showing the sharing of traditions and the dialogue is doing, doing some marvelous work. Um, in, in, in another sense, you can find statements which show that uh, the, both Orthodox and Catholics see a special responsibility for this dialogue within the ecumenical movement. There are different statements on that. And finally, section three, Orthodox Catholic reconciliation, a key to ecumenical progress in the 21st century. I think this relationship is one of the keys to ecumenical progress because first of all, as we move forward and continually overcome the, the effects of what happened nine and a half centuries ago and move to the point where we can put, that, put that, uh, those divisions in the past, that would be a marvelous thing for us, the two of us, and for everybody in the ecumenical movement. Secondly, the Orthodox Catholic reconciliation can contribute to the broader ecumenical movement it may be helpful in fostering continuing reconciliation between the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church with Reformation churches. The American Orthodox Dialogue, in its comments on the Balaman text, made this important point. The document's historical account, Balaman's historical account, does not highlight the important role which the Protestant Reformation played in the West and its impact on Roman Catholic 
ecclesiology. Mention of this would help, help to explain how attitudes of exclusivism justly criticized in the Valamin document developed among Roman Catholics, not primarily in response to the Orthodox, but to other crises and controversies. The, the Reformation on both sides, Catholic and Protestant, was an enormously an intense, hostile event, which we're still trying to get beyond but it had also an impact on Orthodox Catholic relations. To look at this from another point of view, some positions taken by Reformation churches against Rome in the 16th century were also in conflict with Orthodox positions. Serious resistance by some Reformation churches to episcopacy and the threefold ministry of Bishop Presbyterian Deacon may well be seen primarily in light of the conflict with the Roman Catholic Church in the 16th century. Conditions in the West and the Church in the West were in need of great, great reform, and we learned that lesson badly. But they were different from the conditions in the Orthodox East. Some Lutherans and Reformed tried to make common cause with Orthodox against Roman Catholics. The Orthodox were willing to make cause against the Roman Catholics, I think, at that time, but they didn't agree with a lot of the theology of the, of the, uh, of the Reformed. So there are, there are common views that Orthodox and Catholics hold on the role of episcopacy in the structure of the church and on the historic threefold ministry that may help to put those issues, take them out of the realm of simply Catholic-Protestant 16th century conflict and put them in the broader context of earlier and long-held convictions of East and West. And there's a challenge coming right now in the ecumenical movement. In 1982, the great document, Baptism, Eucharist, and Ministry, in its ministry section, um, analyzed this question of, of the, 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 the ministry, especially the threefold ministry of bishop, presbyter, and deacons, and it said, historically, the threefold ministry became the generally accepted pattern of the church in the early centuries and is still retained today by many churches. And Bem suggested, therefore, that in the ecumenical world, in order to bring divided churches closer, that although there is no single New Testament pattern of ministry, nonetheless, the threefold ministry of bishop, presbyter, and deacon may serve today as an expression of the unity we seek and also a means for achieving it. Um, and it suggested that churches not having the threefold pattern will need to ask themselves whether the threefold pattern as developed from early times does not have a powerful claim to be accepted by them. That was in the BEM document and there wasn't, um, that question is still, still to be asked. Now, in 2012, a new faith and order document, The Church Towards a Common Vision, is being published, and that question is put forward in a more dramatic way. It says, quote, given the signs of growing agreement uh, about the place of ordained ministry in the church, we are led to ask if the churches can achieve a consensus as to whether or not the threefold ministry is God, part of God's will for the church in its realization of the unity which God's, God wills. In this discussion, I think Orthodox and Catholics have similar perspectives. And the concern of those who see the episcopacy as vulnerable to abuse may also have in mind the conditions of the church in the West in the 16th century, which led to divisions. We had to deal with that in the Council of, Ch of Trent and the renewal of the episcopacy and to avoid, to get rid of all of the abuses on the episcopacy. But the common perspectives of the early East and West on this issue can be important in this discussion, and the continuing reconciliation of East and West can help us witness together on disputed ecumenical questions such as this. And so the Orthodox Catholic dialogue has produced a great deal over the last 50 years, and for this, we can be grateful. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Monsignor.
At this time, we'll open the floor up for uh, questions. And when you want to ask a question, if you wouldn't mind coming up to this microphone and not talking until you get to the microphone because the lecture is being uh, recorded and will be available on a DVD later. Monsignor, I have a simple question that may actually have no answer, but knowing how much greater an impact a gesture might have in other places and how this has been used to further ecumenical relations, do you see any implication, any meaning in Benedict's dropping of his title Patriarch of the West from his official roster? I think there was some level of mystery to all of that because it sort of disappeared. I mean, it uh, wasn't clear. Cardinal Casper, Cardinal Casper tried to uh, respond to that. One of the, one of the, uh, one of the uh, suggestions he made was that in the, the terms East and West, I mean, today, East and the Orthodox churches are all over the West. And Western churches are all over the East, and it's 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 a kind of, East and West is, in some ways, a different a different a different thing now, a different thing now. Um, I think that's one consideration. Um, but the uh, perhaps not that's not a satisfactory response to that. Um, it might be, uh, it would have been good if we, if we had a clear idea of why he dropped it. It might have been good. He, he may have been trying to say something about the, uh, uh, to reinforce the Petrine ministry. Um, but uh, how, you can, how you can take that symbol, I don't know. I don't know how, I don't know how far you can take that, that factor of his dropping the title. Maybe others know that. I don't know, but I'm not sure. Monsignor, um, one of the things that repeatedly is in the Code of Canons for the Eastern Churches, as well as in the uh, Code of Canons for the West, is the insistence upon the papal universal and immediate jurisdiction. Uh, the concept really doesn't have a historical basis in the first millennium, and how do you see them, the dialogue progressing with that as such an important aspect of the understanding of the papacy in the Catholic churches? I think that's a very good question. I have the sense that the current dialogue, Orthodox Catholic dialogue, dealing with primacy and synodality and some of the issues that we just heard a little while ago, that question uh, will come up, and uh, it, it may be, it may be that, because when you're dealing with, with the situation of, of unity, it's a different thing than when you're dealing with defensive positions in division. Uh, I, there are probably a lot of different factors on that. In 19th century Europe, for example, the church was under attack uh, and so the papacy was made stronger in Vatican I. The, I mean, there was a great... Uh, the political situation had something to do with, with I think, the, with this, the strong treatment of the papacy in Vatican I. I think it, we're, we're, we're living in a new situation ecumenically, and um, it, we'll have to see how this dialogue works out and whether those canonical directives, um, what role they have to play in the dialogue. I think, I think we're still, we still wait to see that. I think what we're, we're committed to is that the role of the, the special role of the Bishop of Rome is God's will for the church. How that turns out in terms of canonical factors we can see. Even in the, the decree on ecumenism that we read before, and then in the Pope's letter, Eunte's in Mundum, 
on the occasion of the Millennium of Russia, where he um, spoke about, as the Creon Ecumenism says, that the um, from early times traditions had took their own took their own leadership. I forget exactly the words. That's early times. There was a diversity that comes up in the decree on ecumenism. I think that'll be a factor in this discussion. To be a factor in the discussion with the Orthodox and dialogue, and I think that would have some impact on the question that you raise. So it may be that through the ecumenical dialogue, East and West, we can get further clarification on exactly that point. So, better ways to get the message to normal lay people. It, 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 it's where it re ultimately needs to go. I mean, ask many lay people, Orthodox or Catholic, what is infallibility? They don't know. I talked to my brother and sister-in-law about the, how the papacy was once strengthened long ago in history and how it, it didn't used to always look the way it is today. And there was like shock. You mean it's not always going to be this way? You see, so uh, how do we take this message forward and, and open a dialogue with the people? The message of... Uh, well, ecumenism, well, you know, better understanding all the way through. Yeah. Yeah, that's um, when I worked at the Pontifical Council for Christian Unity, that was always a big concern. It's a concern of Pope John Paul II in one of his early statements. I think his first statement to the Secretary for Christian Unity after his becoming Pope in 1978, he raised this question about the dialogues. He raised the question about seminary training. How are the seminarians going to learn about this, how are they going to be able to express the results of dialogue to the people unless they know about them? He was, you know, he was, he was raising that question. The ecumenical directory uh, states, I think, pretty clearly that there should be a course on ecumenism in the seminaries. There should be that course in seminary training. And um, I don't know how many seminaries around the country are, are following that. Seminaries are pressed. They, have, they wonder how many courses on this and that they need in order to train, in order to train uh, the seminarians with all the other things the seminarians have to do. But is there some way that there can be... Uh, in one of my teaching experiences in the last four or five years, I taught at St. Joseph's in Dunwoody, they had a course, a two-credit course for deacons. So the deacons had their three years of theology and more, and then they were asked to take a course, a required course on ecumenism, a two-credit course, to ensure that um, they had that experience. And of course, the, um, uh, the decree on ecumenism and the directory also say that Ecumenical, ecumenism has to, has to be reflected in all theology, all of theology. It has to be brought in. So you have on the one hand the need for a course on it itself. Then you have on the other hand the need to integrate ecumenical themes into, into um, all other theology. I taught a course, I'm teaching a course on the Trinity, on the, on the Trinity for deacons, for prospective permanent deacons. And so I said, well, this would be an opportunity to see how, how could I bring some themes of ecumenism into our teaching on the, you know, on the Trinity. So it was a challenge. I think I managed to do some of that, but it's... Uh, so it's uh, basically it's a question of education. And, and even on, in parish levels, I remember one of the parishes that I served on weekends about when I was, before I went to Rome, uh, they had a person in the parish who was the ecumenical contact person. And her responsibility was exactly to see what the opportunities were for the, par for the parish to get involved in ecumenical work, whether it, was, whether it was at the week of prayer for Christian unity, Thanksgiving or some other day, she would be there to 
to uh, see that um, this was brought to the attention of the pastor and that they could do something. And she was very dedicated and did a wonderful job. When she retired from that, no one took her place. And so that factor, you know, that factor went by the same side. By the side. But I think it's good, for example, there are many things. It's good that the seminary here has this, has this ecumenical course and gives an opportunity. You know, there are many ways in which opportunities can be found. It's, that's the challenge for us. Monsignor, where does the Orthodox and Catholic dialogue stand in regard to the Filioque controversy? In 1995, when um, Pope John Paul II and Bartholomew um, together confessed the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed in Greek, in his homily at that, at that Mass, the Pope requested that a study be done that shows the compatibility of the filioque to the Nicene Creed, that it doesn't contradict, it doesn't contradict the faith expressed in the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed in Greek. So that study was done by a group of uh, scholars brought together by the Pontifical Council for Christian Unity and was published, and it shows the many dimensions of that. Uh, it shows that uh, before 381, the, the Council of Constantinople, that before 381, there were very well-known Catholic fathers of the church who's, who's, uh, who used filioque-type language in their, in, their, um, in their theology. And it showed that certain orthodox theologians also, like Maximus the Confessor, had some um, expressions that, that were very compatible to the, to the filioque. And so it showed different nuances like that. The American Orthodox Catholic Dialogue, I think, has, um, has made a, a proposal in dealing in its statement on the filioque that um, the proposal that translations of the creed should not be should be should be done on the basis of the original Greek. I think that's the way they put it, if I'm not mistaken. They were more direct. But you also what you have now since 1987 are a number of instances of the Pope and Patriarch confessing the creed in the original Greek. Is that pattern going to grow? Is it going to grow further? Will we, are we seeing that, uh, some evolution there? So uh, the question still remains, uh, filioque is there. The Catholic position is that it does not contradict the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed, that the, the Western view is that the addition of, from the Father and the Son was to emphasize the communion the consubstantial communion of the three persons of the Trinity, um, whereas the original uh, uh, creed in Greek um, emphasizes the um, God as the primary source. That that argument has been used in um, in different theological works. So it still stands there. We still have the practice in in the West, but with the understanding it doesn't contradict the, um, the creed, the faith of the creed. Monsignor John, you pointed out how the Balaman statement has been received at various levels in various degrees of acceptance. My particular interest is in the Holy Mountain, and I'm wondering um, did all of the abbots of the Holy Mountain sign that uh, uh, from the Epistasia? Or was that just certain abbots of the monasteries signing that document? That's my first question. And the second question is, is has the Holy Mountain been uh, asked to become participants in the dialogue? Because they're very important and very influential. Yeah. On the first point, I simply don't know. I took that, I think, uh, from Father Ron Robertson's the article that I mentioned that Ron Robinson had written, and he expressed that, I documented that way by, by his. 
uh, he doesn't go into that question. He may know the answer to that, hasn't gone into that. On the second point, it's up to the Orthodox to, to invite the Orthodox participants. Whether they've invited any from there, I don't know. Uh, related to that, though, I think the Ecumenical Patriarch a few years ago had some very strong words for, for those, for people who are saying those very negative things about the dialogue. Maybe he was aiming at the Holy Mountain a little bit. Well, I know something about the Holy Mountain, and I know, and I know some of the abbots, and uh, I, I, that's why I'm, 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 I'm wondering. Than, yeah, I, you may know more than I. I don't Thank know. Thank you. Uh, we have time for one more question. I feel bad. It's like taking the last cookie in the jar. <laughs> <laughs> Monsignor, thank you for your talk. Um, I wonder if you could tell us, please, if the papacy should still divide us. The North American consultation on the Filioque ended with the words, I mean, had towards the end, the words that the Filioque need no longer divide us. And really, not much happened in the official positions of any of those churches it was just the realization. And so sometimes I wonder why is the papacy still dividing us? And coming back to uh, Sister's question um, about the papacy, how it looks to common folk. So theologically, of course, there are some significant issues. Canon law, there are some significant issues. But when I ask many of my Catholic friends um, how important is the papacy for them, I do not get a very convincing argument. Um, uh, or a very convincing response. And then when I look at some of my Orthodox uh, brothers and sisters and I ask them the same thing, how they're impacted directly by the papacy, um, again, I wonder how, how is the papacy meant to have an impact into the daily lives of the faithful? Well, I think it's... Um I think there are certain things. I, I remember. I remember the uh, when John Paul II called in 1986 for the Assisi Day of Prayer for Peace, and he was able to gather together leaders of all the Christian churches and leaders of the great world religions. I remember some some of my uh, Protestant friends saying, "He's the only one that can do that. He's the only one. There's no one else that can do that." in that way. So I think, are there not some instances, some situations on the universal level that certain, some things have to be done and it requires someone to be able to call people together? Now he was able to call people together who were not of the Roman Catholic Church. You know, he was able to call um, Muslims and, and they respected him because they see him as a universal figure a person with authority, in the best sense of authority. So I think, I think one answer to that is that I believe that there are things that have to be done at the universal level for the benefit of the church, and it requires a universal leader, a protos at the universal level, as the Ravenna document says. And if you don't have that, it's difficult for things to happen. So I think that's one answer, that the church exists also at the universal level and needs care at that level, and so the Pope, uh, we say, is one who does that. I, th I think that's, um, were there other a nuances of your question? Were there other aspects of your question? But that, that's my response to that, at least. I think it's, it's seen as necessary on different levels. And I think, uh, <clears throat> I think his impact, John Paul's impact in Eastern Europe, I think was such that, uh, because of his, his universal stature, so to speak, he could have an impact on Europe that he did. I believe he had a big impact on Europe, communist Europe because of his universal stature. So I, I think the Orthodox Catholic dialogue is on the right path when speaking of the protos at every level, local, regional, universal. There's need at every level. Uh, thank you, Monsignor, for your beautiful and informed words. If